All right, all right. What's up, YouTube? How y'all doing tonight? Thank you for joining. I see everybody's already filling up the chat. That is great. Um, let's see, we got 46 people in here right now on the live. We need to get more people in here. If you can, share this video. Uh, I appreciate every single one of y'all. Thank you so much for coming on here and, and uh, being very loyal uh, uh, leaders, is what I like to call you. I don't like to say followers. I like to say leaders for coming in here all the time consistently and participating and being a part of this. Um, what I'll do, too, is I think I'm going to drop a quick reminder message right before we go live here and uh, see if I can get a few more people to join this uh, this event real quick, okay? So give me one quick second while I do that. It's really great to see every single one of you in here. I just came off of uh, Instagram, and Instagram was amazing. We had Dr. Perry Nicholson on there, and we were giving away free knowledge on things that you can do to stop pain in your body. It was our second time having him on, and that guy is just a wealth of absolute knowledge. I love having him on, um, and uh, looking forward to having him on a lot more as well, okay? And so I'm going to just drop a quick message and remind you, everybody, let's fill up this chat room right quick. Let's fill up this live, and uh, just take me one second here. Hope everyone's having a fantastic uh, holiday season, getting a chance to spend time with family and, uh, you know, just exchange that love that we're supposed to be giving at this time of the year. Whether you believe in the holidays or not, is totally irrelevant. Um, you know, it's just all about being present in the moment. Okay. And if you can be present in the moment, you can actually, you know, get something. You can get something out of life. You know, my, both of my parents are gone right now. Both of my parents are deceased and passed away. Uh, and so that the reality of mortality, let's say, <laughs> it hits you. And, um, you know, you need to really pay attention to your loved ones and don't forget to tell people that you love them, okay? Uh you really need to spend just more time with family when you get these opportunities and, you know, and cherish these moments because these moments are fleeting. Okay. They are fleeting. Uh, and you, you want to be, you want to be present in the moment. So I'm just sent this message out to everybody. Let's see if we can get a few more people to join us on this beautiful evening as I'm getting ready to go live and talk about, Evidence of the Anunnaki on Earth. This is probably going to be a multi-part series because there's so much information, um, you know, to, to go over <laughs> and talk about. It's just so, so much. I see Ninja Cat says, unroll your ear and, and uh, roll your cheek, roll your, <laughs> the inside of your mouth. Yes, that's some of the techniques we were doing by Dr. Perry Nicholson. So thank thank you for following us from there over to here. All right. Okay, great. I see the chat filling up pretty good now. I'm going to go ahead and get into this. Uh, this little mini workshop and get started. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually share my screen and go into presentation mode on you guys. All right. Fantastic. I see KP said just got Billy's text. Thanks a lot, KP. All right. Let's uh, let's get this party started, guys. Let's get this party started. Uh, let's see some screens and audio. Check the box in the next window. Okay. And let's see here, share audio system. And we're going to go to this PowerPoint. OK, you guys should see a full screen here. Now we're going to start the slideshow. And Right before we get started, let me just check from my YouTube app and make sure, because I can't see you guys anymore at the exact moment. I want to make sure everything is 
it's showing properly before we before I click this I can't button. see you guys anymore okay. at the exact moment. I want to make gotcha. sure everything is is showing properly before we okay. before I click this I can't see you guys. Looks fantastic, guys. Let's get this party started, all right? Without further ado. Evidence of the Anunnaki on Earth by Billy Carson. Let's dig deep into some material right now. You are watching Forbidden Knowledge TV. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Anunnaki on Earth. Now, the Anunnaki themselves it, are not just one particular race of beings. The Anunnaki is a multiracial species. Let's understand that. Multiracial from multiple planets. Anunnaki simply put means from heaven to earth, people that came from heaven to earth. In other words, from space to this planet. This is an ancient text, not just in the Sumerian text. The Anunnaki are talked about in many texts. They're talked about in the Bible. They're called the Anak. Uh, they're, they're the Naturu in the Egyptian book of the dead. I mean, I can just go on and on and on. And so uh, these people were real to our ancestors, whether you want to believe it or not. They were real to our ancestors. You have the indigenous uh, tribes of America that talk about their star brothers. You have the aboriginals in Australia talking about the fact that they were seated on this planet, brought to this planet and seated here by Pleiadians. This is not Billy Carson telling you this. This is your these are our ancestors telling us this. Before I get going deep into this, let me get my shameless plugs out of the way. Of course, I'm the author of the Compendium of the Emerald Tablets, a beginner's guide. It's a bestseller on Amazon, and you can buy this book on Amazon.com as well as on my website, ForbiddenKnowledge.com. Also, my second bestseller, Woke Doesn't Mean Broke, uh, and this book is uh, right now doing phenomenal numbers. It was an Amazon bestseller, and of course, is also available on my website. It's financial literacy. Of course, with uh, uh, Forbidden Knowledge, we have Forbidden Knowledge TV. If you want to try it out, you can use uh, coupon code 30 days free. 30 days free, all one word. Go to 4BK.TV and use coupon code 30 days free. You can watch Forbidden Knowledge TV on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, the iOS, Google Play, and the web. And of course, my mobile app, Unite the 99 social media app. Unite the 99 on your app store. It's a five-star app doing very, very well. You can post images, links, uh, you know, uh, videos. You can go live if you're a verified account. You can join groups. You can share information. And there is no, there are no algorithms. There's no suppression of information. So if you want to go there and be and feel free, uh, you can go to Unite the 99. You can post content in there all day long. It's a combination of Facebook, Instagram features built into my own app, and I think it's a great app, and your post will show up in the order that it was made. None of this algorithm stuff. We don't do that there. This is me in Akrotiri, Greece. You know, I, I, I travel the world. I go all over the world. I go to places tracking down evidence of these Anunnaki beings, and one of the locations is Akrotiri, and this is in the Mediterranean. This is off the uh, GNC uh, in Santorini, Okay. And I've actually been here twice. And this image is from the, one of the first times that I went there. Looking at this partially buried city that's being dug out. It was buried by volcanic ash. And just making note of all the technological advances that they had thousands of years ago that we're just now really getting now in, this, in today's current time. I mean, evidence of what looked like PVC piping, even though it's not made of the same plastic, it's evidence of sophisticated piping for an entire city plumbing system. Toilets on the second floor that flush. Not only do they flush, but they also have a mechanism that takes the smell from the poop and takes it out of the house and pushes it away from the building. Okay? Takes it out. We need those today. We still don't have those. Um, and just these megalithic blocks that have these, you know, two centimeter, three centimeter diameter holes bored straight through from one side to the other we don't you know going through solid stone rebar they actually used rebar in these structures five thousand years ago i mean that's just incredible mm -hmm. and so i do a well a good job documenting this and a lot of information about akateri is coming out very very soon i've been to teotihuacan in mexico 
I'm standing here uh, on the Pyramid of the Moon, which was built by Thoth, T-H-O-T-H, -T -H, also known as uh, Quetzalcoatl in, in Mesoamerica. He built this pyramid. I'm standing on top of a pyramid that he built for his wife. It's actually eight pyramids in one. And behind me is the Pyramid of the Sun, which is an identical copy of the Great Pyramid at Giza, except it's 50% of the height of that pyramid. And uh, here I am at the Pyramid of Kukulkan, who's also known as Thoth, uh, down in the Yucatan Peninsula. And here I am again in Cambodia at Angkor Wat, and I'm at Ta Prom. And at Ta Prom, you can see that they, in ancient 5,000-year-old structures, they've etched dinosaurs into some of these temples. But dinosaurs with the meat on their bones, which means that humans and dinosaurs coexisted at one point in the distant past. Don't forget about Meditation Monday. That's uh, every Monday morning at 6 a.m. For reminder text, I'm going to start doing the reminder text again. You can text me, text hashtag meditation to 954-245-0086, and I will text you a reminder for Meditation Mondays. We've been doing some phenomenal Meditation Mondays consecutively every single week now for months and people are getting a lot out of them. Sometimes I do a live guided meditation. Sometimes I pre-record it and upload it depending on my travels. But every single Monday morning at 6 a.m., we have a beautiful Meditation Monday, okay? Let's get into it, guys. We're talking about the Great Pyramid and how the Great Pyramid itself is encoded with advanced knowledge, okay? Advanced knowledge. And this is really important because when we're talking about looking for evidence, just the word itself, evidence, what we're talking about is information that leaves clues to what happened in the past, whether it was a minute ago or whether it was a million years ago. We're looking for the evidence, clues. And these clues, if you have enough clues that you can piece together in a court of law, they call it circumstantial evidence. And so and if you have enough circumstantial evidence, you can build a case for something in a court of law, right? And so the same exact technique is used by archaeologists and biologists and anthropologists and scientists. We all use the same exact technique that the court system uses. We all try to build up a certain amount of circumstantial evidence based off of clues that we get from whatever it is, whether it's research and uh, investigation, whether it's a duplicatable experiment and we're looking at results from different types of experiments, whatever it is, we're looking for these clues. So what can you point to or what can any of us point to on this planet that can be accessed by our physical body that could be, that has been analyzed multiple times by literally by now, tens of thousands of people, uh, thousands of scientists, tens of thousands of researchers, CAT scans, data scans, muon scans, ground penetrating scans, satellite scans, images from every angle and position. When you have all the information on this structure, this great pyramid, you now have something that we can, that's tangible, that we can get a lot of data from, that we can analyze, that we can process through our own computer systems and come up with uh, enhanced information about these clues to dig deeper into them and figure out how they how they connect to other things. So we have something here with this Great Pyramid. And what we found is that it's deeply encoded with advanced knowledge, which we're going to talk about today. Now, who built this Great Pyramid? Now, when you go to Egypt on your mainstream tour, you're going to, you know, you're going to hear Khufu and all these other names of these, these pharaohs that try to claim that they, they built this pyramid. Didn't happen. OK, the, those 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 pharaohs didn't build the, not the Great Pyramid. Did pharaohs ever build pyramids? Yes. That's another thing that people seem to misconstrue when I'm talking. They try to. Take the information and twist it. I never said that pharaohs uh, uh, never built any pyramids. I'm talking about specifically the Great Pyramid. Now, what's interesting, although even about the other pyramids, that there was one master architect to these pyramids, one master teacher laid down the plans to everyone else and then taught the techniques on how to build these pyramids, the majority of them, not all of them. But in particular, the Great Pyramid was built by Thoth, the Atlantean priest king that ruled over the land of Kim for 14,000 years, long before it was called Egypt. Okay, And uh, 
in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, uh, he says, Build it I, the Great Pyramid, patterned after the Pyramid of Earth's force, burning eternally so that it too might remain through the ages. In it, I build it my knowledge of magic science that translates into advanced technology. So that I might, so I, it might be here again when I return from Amenti. I, while I sleep in the halls of Amenti, my soul roaming free will incarnate and dwell amongst men in one form or another. And what he's referencing there is that these halls of Amenti that were discovered underneath the Great Pyramid Complex, and I've actually been there. I've been to the one in Saqqara as well, which is also a hall of Amenti for his father, Enki. And I got into one of the rejuvenation chambers and we have the live video footage of that. We have the 4K video and that's going to be coming out in one of my newest episodes of Ancient Connections on Forbidden Knowledge TV. It's going to blow your mind. And what he's talking about is the fact that they had cloned themselves, not humans. They didn't take humans and clone humans. They cloned their own, their own selves. They had their own bodies, their own sleeves, and they would transfer their consciousness into each individual body and walk amongst men, but unlike a man. And that while one body was laying in the rejuvenation chamber, they would walk amongst men. And when that body got worn out, they would put it back in a chamber, rejuvenate it, transfer into another body and walk amongst men. This is why Thoth and Anki and, and Lil and all these people, they have all these names over so many thousands of years. Their names have changed, but it's always the same person because they've lived so many millennia across time by transferring consciousness, which is something that we're now just starting to do in what we call modern science. We have the Avatar Project by DARPA, where they now can connect a soldier's consciousness to a field robot that's doing battle. The soldier is in an underground bunker. The robot is out in the field on the battleground. And the only thing that happens if that robot gets blown up or damaged is the symbiotic link is severed. The soldier stays alive. Also, you have... 2045 project 2045.com 2045.com check it out Ray Kurtz real he's got his project he's been doing this now working on this project for a couple decades they've already transferred a, a monkey's consciousness into a computer and the body is gone the body's been dead but the monkey is still alive in the computer it's eating bananas it's climbing trees it doesn't even know it's in a computer the body's gone by 2010, that was done early in the 2000s. By 2010, they were supposed to transfer human consciousness into a robotic body, which has already been done by DARPA. So I'm quite clear that they've done that by now. The main goal was by 2045 was to be able to clone a human person from their own skin cell or for their own, their own DNA to any age specified and then transfer their consciousness into that new body so they can continue to live on. Okay. That's the 2045 project. We're doing right now, today, what was already being done tens of thousands of years ago by these people that some call the Anunnaki, some call the Atlanteans, some call the Nituru, the gods, the Olympians, the Pantheon, all the same exact people. All the same exact people. Here's, here's a picture of me inside the king's chamber uh, of the Great Pyramid. And you see I'm standing in front of that box right there. Now, this pyramid is, is, first of all, it's massive. The photos can never do justice as to how incredible it is to be inside of uh, this pyramid and being standing in front of it. First of all, with over 2 million blocks of multi-ton stones, it creates a gravity bubble around the pyramid Okay, because of the sheer mass. There's a time dilation that happens. So when you stand next to the Great Pyramid, it's already been scientifically calculated and proven. Time actually slows down for you by standing, by just standing next to it. Right here, you see a picture of me standing next to that pyramid. Time is moving for me at that moment when I was there. Time was moving just ever so slightly slower for me than somebody standing further away from the pyramid because of time dilation, because of the mass and warped space time. That itself is incredible. And when you're standing next to this thing, you can just feel the energy. You can feel the power. This is why you have to come on the tour of Egypt with me, the Forbidden Tour of Egypt. That's going to be October 22nd, 2022. But seats are filling up fast. Only 50. Well, not, there's literally less than 50 because I have my camera crew, security, the guide, the Egyptologist, 
uh, myself, Elizabeth Huckstra. And uh, so really 40 seats available, 40. So out of the 40, we probably have about, I don't know, 12 or 13 seats left, okay? But you can register on forbiddenknowledge.com and you can get registered to come on this private tour with us. We're going to go underneath the Great Pyramid. We're going to go down looking for the Halls of Adventure. We're going to meditate underneath the Pyramid. We're going to go into the King's Chamber in the Pyramid and do a private meditation there. We're going to have private access. Nobody allowed to touch this Pyramid except for us at that moment. We're going to be given the, you know, the green light, so to speak, and the red carpet will be rolled out for us as we have uh, the power to secure private access to this structure and uh, and the Great Sphinx as well. So you don't want to miss that. But here I am standing inside the king's chamber and you can see this stone box that I'm standing in front of. This stone box uh, is not a sarcophagus as mainstream archaeologists and Egyptologists will tell you. This box was added, a feature that was actually added to the king's chamber tens of thousands of years after the pyramid was built. This pyramid was a, uh, of just one of the things it was, was a power generator, okay? It used physiostatic electricity by pulling ions out of running water underneath the bottom level. Uh, run that water, water from the aquifer underneath the pyramid would run against the crystal granite. The magnetized crystal granite would then push those ions up into uh, the pyramid. Some of the water from the aquifer would be pushed down into the queen's chamber, and the queen's chamber acted as a hydrogen uh, extraction device via electrolysis. And the other energy would be pushed up the uh, the, the uh, grand gallery, where resonating rods would stamp up the power, and it would enter into this king's chamber area where it then will be magnified and pushed up through the apex directly at the top of the pyramid and send wireless electricity around the planet, which would then be picked up by the giant obelisk. The crystal granite obelisk would carry, capture that energy and transfer it from place to place like a wireless uh, light pole, electric poles, basically. And then they would use a jet pillar to capture the ambient energy coming from these, uh, these gigantic uh, crystal granite uh, obelisks. And then there will be a cord coming from the jet pillar to light bulbs and electro, uh, gold electropating devices and, uh, and and all kind of weaving devices. They used electricity back then. They had a good source of electricity in ancient Egypt and ancient Kim. Now, this box, the story about it is very interesting. Evidence shows me that this box was added, well, I don't know, it could be 30,000 years after the pyramid was built. You, when you go in there and you analyze this 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 granite box, <clears throat> and you analyze how it's connected to the floor, it's positioned inside the king's chamber, which is directly beneath the apex. And then also you see where that giant piece is chipped off on the corner. There was a huge power surge in there that, that made that piece snap off and fly across the room and impact the wall. And it dented crystal granite across the room about maybe 20 yards away with the same exact shape of that broken piece, which tells you that it flew that far, that heavy piece flew that far. How do you snap crystal granite? This type of this rock hard, incredibly, the only thing that can cut granite is granite or a diamond. And this thing snapped off like it was nothing and flew about 20 yards across the room with such force that it impacted another piece of granite and made its own indention and shape into that granite. Tells me there was a power source inside this uh king's chamber not only that when you take the measurements of this uh stone box you start to find out it's the same exact dimensions as the ark of the covenant as described in the biblical text and then when you start digging into the egyptian book of the dead and some of the other texts you start to realize that they had a device that was put into this stone box because the pyramid had long been broken the system the power generation had been kind of broken why because the nile shifted and as the nile shifted away from the uh flows that naturally go underneath where the pyramid was built those underground aquifers dried up and became just dry open empty tubes and tunnels underneath the pyramid and that broke some of the process as the water slowed down the the energy production slowed down and by putting the Ark of the Covenant in that spot, which was a power a power generating device that most likely used nuclear power uh, in some way, shape, or form, 
And the reason why now, again, more circumstantial evidence, if you look at the evidence of if you look at the information left behind by ancient cultures in the Torah about the people that handled the Ark of the Covenant, what they had to wear, they had to wear lead, they had to wear rubber boots, they had to wear rubber gloves, they had to have this shield over their body. Whoever didn't do that and directly touched it, not only would they be struck dead instantly, but the people who were around it without the right protection, their nails would fall out. Their eyes would bleed. Their hair would fall out. This is all signs of radiation sickness, radiation poisoning. So it was highly radio radioactive, whatever it was. When they put it in that box, it gave that last boost that it needed to energize that spark that would send that power up through the apex, which used to be a, a gold capstone, and that would then send the energy out into, uh, into the atmosphere. Ironically, the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid is incredible because let's take a look at the speed of light, for example. Uh, 299,792, 458 meters per second, right? I'm sorry, 2,999,792, 299,792,458 meters per second. I'm sorry. And so look at the geographic coordinate for the Grand Gallery of the Great Pyramid. It's 29. Point nine seven nine two four five eight degrees north. The numbers are identical. Why is that? That's because the speed of light we know moves at around close to three hundred, uh, you know, uh, million meters per second. But also that the the, the 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 location of the Grand Gallery itself was built on that particular location and that angle to match the speed of light, sending another hidden message to us as to the functions and the functionality of the Great Pyramid itself. It's another little hidden nugget that they built into the stone structure for people born in this era right now, this time right now that we are in, to understand that this is just more, this is more than just a stack of blocks. These aren't just giant Legos. There's a purpose to this, and there was a use for this. This was a multifunctional stone computer that gave you also astronomical and quantum physical information, okay? So the speed of light in the vacuum, you see it here, meters per second. Now, people say, wait a minute, meters per second? Meters didn't even exist back then. Mm, a lot of people say that, but they didn't research it before they spoke. They only went by what they learned in school. <laughs> people keep going by what they learned in school. When you go by what you learn in school, a lot of the times, you get screwed. I'm sorry. Dig into some ancient information, and you find out that there was proto-cuneiform discovered. Now, cuneiform primarily is a language that was thought to have been developed by Sumerians in Mesopotamia, right? Well, answer me this, <laughs> as they would say. How in the world did proto-cuneiform metric system data on tablets, etched in the stone tablets, get discovered in South America? Look it up. Proto-Egyptian... Uh, writing, cuneiform writing, discovered in Mesoamerica, in South America, in Mexico region, uh, also pottery and everything else with cuneiform etched into it in the Americas. Not only that, but also with a metric system, which you can see here in place, intact metric system, we're talking about way over 10,000 years ago. So the metric system that you learned about in school that we, you know, we, we, we just recently discovered in modern, what we call modern times, just simply a rediscovery. More than likely, the person that, the gentleman, I forget his name at the moment, that came up with the metric system, I think two people came up with it almost simultaneously. He probably got a download from, because all knowledge exists in the universe, or they may have been researching this on their own and found out, holy crap, there's a metric system. This is a way of, a better way of measuring things. Let's use this. So the metric system existed long before what we know as modern time metric system, which means that, yes, the Great Pyramid, uh, they understood the metric system as well. The, the, the builders, the, the developers, the architect, they knew all about it. It wasn't a mystery to them because it already existed long before uh, we had it here in, quote unquote, modern times. Right. So one of the one of the, uh, the best anomalies. Is right here on Earth. You know, you see me standing here next to, and I'm actually up a few blocks on the Great Pyramid at Giza. 
that's an old photo there, probably back in 2014 when I went um, uh, previous time. But what's amazing is the embedded constants. Again, we're looking for these clues that show evidence that somebody came here, right? There's embedded constants in the Great Pyramid, and we're going to look at some of those right now. Now, the tropical year or the calendar year is calculated easily by the measurements of the Great Pyramid. The length of the base side is 9,131 pyramid inches measured at the mean socket level or 365.24 pyramid cubits, which is the number of days in a year. Okay, so you can calculate the number of days in the year or the tropical year just based on the actual cubits uh, and the mean socket level in pyramid inches. That's not an accident. That's on purpose. The perimeter of the base divided by 100 equals 365. Again, they're telling us uh, the, the amount of days in a year. The number of days in a year, 9,131 pyramid inches uh, times 4 divided by 100 is accurate to within five digits. The tropical year, again, can be calculated by the length of the antechamber used as the diameter of a circle, which produces a circumference of 365. Again, not only they're telling us uh, the circumference, but they're also telling us how many days are in a year. Okay, The tropical year, the ratio of the length of the Grand Gallery to the solid diagonal of the King's Chamber times 100 equals the number of days in a tropical year. I mean, this, they've, they've given this to us in so many different ways that it's hard to deny. It's hard to say that this is just a coincidence when they've given it to us in six or seven different ways for us to calculate the same exact thing. You can also calculate the sidereal year, the length of the antechamber of the great uh, of the king's chamber times pi equals the length of the sidereal year. OK, so we have all of this evidence, guys, all of this evidence. And they've given it to us in multiple ways so that it's undeniable. In other words, if something happens and an occurrence happens one time, you know, this is a coincidence, this is a weird coincidence. But when you get and they give it to you one, two, three, four times in the same structure, it was purposeful. This is not a coincidence anymore. Let's see. Okay. Now, the mean distance to the sun, you can calculate that. Half of the length of the diagonal of the base times 10 to the sixth power equals the average distance to the sun. So you can calculate the distance from the earth to the sun via the, 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 uh, uh, the base uh, of, the, of the pyramid. Now, what's interesting about this is first <laughs> to understand this, guys. Let's really, you have to take your brain and wrap it around this. Because what I'm saying to you is whoever programmed this calculation into the Great Pyramid already knew the distance to the sun. Do you understand what I'm saying? Whoever programmed this, whoever designed this, architecturally encoded this into the pyramid structure already knew pre-knowledge the distance from the earth to the sun and then said okay now i'm going to program this into my architectural work so that so that they can figure out how great i am you see what i'm saying this is incredible knowledge and according to the ancient egyptians the comedic people this information was brought to them by the nituru Okay, the beings who came from heaven to earth and turned mud into a kingdom. And what happens in the Emerald Tablets? Thoth says, while the waters were receding and the great temple was rising out of the mud, I was sent on a mission to restart civilization in the land of Kem. Guys, and he's one of the Naturu. He's one of the Naturu, okay? The mean, now, just as before in the previous page, we had the calculations were showing up multiple times. Here again, we could see to, to avoid people saying this is a coincidence, the builder says, no, no, I'll do this again multiple times. The mean distance to the sun, the height of the pyramid times 10 to the ninth power represents the mean radius of the earth and the orbits of, of the earth around the sun, or the also the astronomical units, the AU. In, in astrophysics, there's something called the AU, which is the astronomical unit. And that is a, gives us the ability to measure 
how far away things are from Earth. So the distance from the Earth to the sun would be one AU. And by using that measurement piece, you can calculate how many AUs there are from the, from the Earth to the moon, the Earth to the Mars, the Earth to Saturn, Venus, and so forth and so on, and Pluto, whatever. You can calculate the AUs, astronomical units. Because the numbers become too big, you got to start with something even bigger that can encapsulate the concept of the number system. So they went to the AU system in, in astrophysics, right? The sun's radius can be calculated. Twice the perimeter of the bottom of the granite coffer times 10 to the 8th is the sun's mean radius. 427,316 miles is the radius of the sun. That's how big the sun is. It's radius. All right, it's circumference around the equator. Now, what's interesting about this, again, wrap your mind around this for a second. In order to calculate the radius of the sun, you need to know what the radius of the sun is. I'm going to say that again. In order to calculate the radius of the sun, you would have need to have pre-knowledge of what the radius of the sun was, which means you are a person, a being with advanced technology that has the capability of utilizing satellites, probes, ships, whatever you want to, whatever it could be technologically to calculate the radius of that sun, of our sun. And then take that knowledge and that wisdom about those those uh, calculations and then embed it into an architectural floor plan to build the structure that we call the Great Pyramid. This shows forethinking, which means before thinking, forethinking, pre-thinking. It shows advanced knowledge and it also shows evidence of advanced technology that had been used to, to create this structure. People didn't just roll out of bed and say, we're going to stack these blocks up. It's a lot deeper than that. It's a lot deeper than that. Now, the Earth's polar radius, we can calculate the polar radius. The polar radius, if you know what that means, it's not the radius around the equator. It's the radius of the Earth from pole to pole this way. The sacred cubit times 10 to the seventh power equals the polar radius of the Earth. The distance from the North Pole to Earth's center, 25 pyramid inches times 10 to the seventh power times um, 1.00181 in one pyramid, which is one pyramid inch, you get to calculate 3,950 miles. So what they're saying here is you can calculate the radius of the, of the earth from pole to pole, which is different than this way because the earth is not perfectly round. It's more of an egg shape. And then also you can calculate the distance from the, from the pole to the center of the earth planet or from the pole to the equator line. You can calculate that distance as well, all by using the measurements that are encoded into the Great Pyramid. Now, again, what does this mean? You would have had to have to known this before you created these calculations. Again, pre-knowledge. You can calculate Earth's polar radius, which is the sacred cubit times 10 to the seventh power, which equals the polar radius of the Earth. Earth's polar radius, the pyramid embodies a scale ratio of one by 43,200. The height. So, but let me say, let me stop there for a second. So, what they're saying here is Earth's polar radius is the pyramid embodiment of a ratio of one by 43,200. What does that mean? Okay. Let me see if I can take this here for an example. I'm looking for a, a ball. I think I have this one here. Uh, well, here it goes. Let me grab one of these pyramids. Hold on. I don't know if you guys can see this off screen. But there's a pyramid in my hand. I hope you can see me in a little box. Now, if you take a, a sphere around this pyramid in my hand and say that's the Earth, a scale of the, the pyramid, when you put this great pyramid and you scale it up to the sides of the planet Earth, it fits perfectly inside. And each one of these corners touches a piece of the inside of the Earth. So the pyramid itself is an exact scale of the planet a one by 43,200 scale. And ironically, the Great Pyramid resonates at 40, 40, uh, 432 hertz, 432. We're going to see the 432 replicating throughout the Great Pyramid consistently. And what, what's one of the best frequencies to listen to in music? 432 hertz, which is what all my songs are all encoded at 432 hertz because it is one of the best healing frequencies for the body DNA and organizes consciousness organizes the molecules even in the brain okay pretty powerful stuff 
So again, just you know, give, trying to give you guys an, a, a breakdown here. We're talking about serious advanced knowledge. I mean, I can go on and on with these calculations, but I'm a, I'm just going to knock down a couple of the more incredible ones real quickly before we move on. Uh, with the Great Pyramid, you can actually calculate a lot of advanced things. Okay, the Great Pyramid of Giza is a highly intelligent design that clearly demonstrates that the builders possessed highly advanced geodetic astronomical and astrophysical knowledge well beyond what has been taught by advanced mathematics, including Newtonian mathematics. The following is a list of conclusions drawn from analysis of the relationship of the dimensions found within the Great Pyramid. You can calculate the precise definition of the royal cubit as it relates to the Earth, the size and shape of the Earth, the mass and density of the Earth, the gravitational constant, the escape velocity of Earth to obtain an orbit. That's incredible. That means you have to travel 33 times the speed of sound to escape Earth's gravity. By the way, if you didn't know that, that's what the secret of the 33rd degree Masons is. It has nothing to do with taking over the planet. It has to do with leaving the planet. The escape velocity of Earth to attain an escape from the combined Earth and Sun's gravitational field. The significance of the location of the Great Pyramid. Now, what is that significance? The significance of the location of the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid is located at the center of the mass on Earth. Not the center of the Earth. The center of land mass. If you take all the land mass, which is all over the place, and you figure out where the center of that land mass is located, the Great Pyramid sits directly on the center of the land mass. Another thing important, the Great Pyramid height is the average height of the peaks of all the peaks on the planet Earth. Okay, let me say that again. The height of the Great Pyramid is the average height of all the peaks. So let me, let me to calculate this, you have to be able to scan every peak on the entire planet, low and high. And then you have to be able to take the average height and divide it by the average number of peaks to come up with the average height. And then you can build a Great Pyramid to that height. In order to do that, you need to scan the entire planet with a polar orbit. So you need to be able to put a satellite up in space. And as the planet spins on its axis, it has to scan every swath of land and create a stitched image with topographical data. And then from the topographical data, you can then calculate how many peaks there are and the heights of those peaks. And then you can divide them by the total number of peaks, and that will give you the exact height to build the Great Pyramid. Think about that, guys. That's incredible technological advancement in ancient times that we did not have access to, that we did not have access to. Okay? Um so also the uh, the golden ratio is built into the Great Pyramid. The mass of the sun is built into the Great Pyramid. The mean distance to the sun and the circumference of the Earth's orbit. The neutral points of gravity between the Earth and the sun. You can even find the X points. Astrophysics call them X points. Portals that open up and close around the outside of the planet Earth. Look it up. Real science. Portals that open up and close. We can find the mean distance to the moon. The orbital velocity of the Earth. The orbital velocity of the moon. The metatonic 19 cycle of year cycle of the moon's orbit of the Earth, the Lagrange point between the Earth and the moon, and the speed of light. Of course, the orbital velocity of the solar system relative to the center of the Milky Way. We can calculate the speed of our galaxy moving around the supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy, and the velocity of the local group of galaxies as they move through the Milky Way and as it moves through the universe it can all be calculated from the calculations in the pyramid inches in the base and the high antechamber grand gallery of the Great Pyramid. This is hidden encoded knowledge that was left here for us in this time to break down, understand and digest and discern. The evidence is here. The circumstantial evidence has been left behind and the clues are mathematical clues that have been built into a structure that we all have access to for the most part that gives the evidence that these people that have been talked about in all these ancient texts and tablets and scriptures and cylinder scrolls and handed down verbal histories, they were here and they had the same exact technology that our ancestors said they had. Undeniable. The Great Pyramid is encoded with the distance to the sun. We just talked about that, which is really incredible because if you think about it, you really have to understand that these beings had superior knowledge and were literally, I estimate, about a million years ahead of us technologically. Okay. And, uh, 
you know, the Anunnaki named Thoth, a.k.a. Negazita in Mesopotamia, who's the son of Enki, in his own words, said he built the Great Pyramid and the Emerald Tablets. And that's what I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with the ancestors. I'm going to go with the ancient ancestors. Uh, <clears throat> here's a very interesting video that we're going to watch for a few minutes. And it's going to give you a breakdown of the Giza Plateau. And it's going to show you something very interesting. <clears throat> More circumstantial evidence for one of the real purposes of the Giza Plateau with the surrounding pyramids and temples that are there. And what were they trying to show us? This is Thoth's time temple, okay? Sit tight for a few minutes and pay attention to this. Forbidden knowledge. Thoth's the time temple is an alignment code. Witness the wisdom of Thoth. The Giza Plateau was his architectural masterpiece on Earth. Thoth built the Great Pyramid and designed the layout of smaller pyramids and temples of Giza to perfectly match today's NASA's image of our solar system. The map is a perfect match right down to the astronomical units, which tell you the distance each planet is from the Sun and one another. The orbits are precise, and the planet sizes are perfect scale relative to the pyramid or temple in the diagram. Watch the full video from Forbidden Knowledge and witness the wisdom of Thoth the Atlantean and his handiwork. Step 1. Line up with the eastern edge of the first pyramid. Step 2. Line up the corners of the first and second pyramid. Step 3. Line up with the northern edge of the third pyramid. Step 4. Line up parallel to the step 3. Step 5. Line up parallel to the step 1. Step 6. Line up the corners of the second and third pyramid. Step 7. Line up with the northern edge of the second pyramid. Step 8. Line up the corners of the second pyramid and the rectangle. Step 9. Line up the corners of the second and third pyramid. Step 10. Line up the corners of the rectangle. Step 11. Line up with the eastern edge of the third pyramid. Step 12. 
12 line up with the southern edge of the first pyramid. Step 13. Line up with the northern edge of the first pyramid. Step 14. Cross the diagonal of the rectangle of the vertical. Mark the time positions and orbits. Venus. Compare this to NASA's version of inner orbits to scale. Flip horizontal view from the other side. Now rotate 107.7 degrees. Mark the major axis of Mars orbit. Mark the major axis of Mercury's orbit. Merge visible.
Guys, you just witnessed something absolutely amazing. You just witnessed Thoth's time temple. You witnessed the fact that Giza is actually a complete star map to the inner planetary system of our solar system. Not only is it a map of the planets, it is a map down to the astronomical units used in modern astrophysics and the exact orbiting patterns of those planets in our solar system around the sun. Now, <laughs> like I said at the beginning of this, circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence, guys. Uh, if there was ever a case for circumstantial ev evidence, this is it. And the fact that this is, um, this is now well known to uh, independent researchers like myself and others, uh, it's not a hidden secret anymore. This isn't, this isn't hidden knowledge. It's, it's kind of forbidden because I'm not going to put this in your astrophysics book and, you know, when you go to college. But this information is available and we're making it available. We are the disclosure. We are bringing this information to the world. We are showcasing this information. We meaning researchers, archaeologists, people who are really the true seekers of the truth, not the mainstream level people. To say, hey, guys, take a look over here. The evidence of what our ancient ancestors have been telling us in these texts and tablets and cylinder scrolls and papyruses is accurate because these people did come here. Not only did they come here, but they also built this structure and they left all of this evidence behind about this structure for us to marvel at, for us to understand that we are just barely, barely, and I mean barely crawling, trying to learn how to walk. They were running back then. They were running. We're trying to learn how to walk. Here's a photo of me, and we're going to wrap this up for tonight. I'm going to have another part two of this uh, coming up soon. But here's a picture of me in the Temple of Abydos. You see me standing there pointing up at the ceiling. You see these glyphs. There's this big thing. Oh, they debunked it because they said, oh, these were rewritten. Guess what, guys? When you go to Egypt and get with the real Egyptologists that lived there, that were born there, that played in these temples and these and these things, that were homegrown guides, they will tell you that's what they were. They were told to say that to mainstream, and that that's an absolute lie. It's an absolute lie. The fact of the matter is, is that these glyphs were never were never retouched. I've been in the Temple of Abydos several times. Now, in this temple. The uh, when when one pharaoh changes over to another, uh, they go in and they rename. If they're going to take over a temple, they'll rename the the cartouches etched into the stone. And wherever their name, wherever the previous pharaoh or ruler's name was, they it's customary. It's not even an insult. It's customary to reface it. Now in this particular temple, that did happen, right? So they went in, which they always do. Uh, and I think it was, I believe it was Ramses, and he started, uh, his, his dad's name was Seti, so he, he went in and started renaming it. Now, when, when these people hire these artisans to go in, these pharaohs hire these artisans to go in and rename these, these cartouches, which are sacred to them, this is like, to them, they're presenting to the people that these that they're they're gods. Like we are the sons of God. We have this God DNA. We're like this bloodline, and so we're better than you. And they rule with utmost like power. And if you made one mistake, they just kill you. Now imagine this for a second. You've got these artisans in here changing these names out because now it's his time to rule, and he's taking over control of this temple. And they're changing all the names out perfectly. Every single one is perfectly changed out except for this one beam. Do you think that this pharaoh is going to walk in there and see this lack of perfection? First of all, you can clearly see that it wasn't any other name there before this. these glyphs appeared. These glyphs were, were etched directly into the stone. You could tell where refacing occurred, pretty much. There's no refacing evidence there, number one. Number two, when that pharaoh walks in there to inspect the work and sees that the work was done half-assed, those artisans are dead, man. They're done. They're done. So the fact that they try to say, though, ifs was they, they made some mistakes and ba ba ba. No. These pharaohs weren't going for mistakes. They didn't 
they weren't going to have these kind of mistakes when it came to their namesake. The egos were too big. I'm telling you right now, you go to Egypt with me, you're going to find out that not only are these glyphs here, they're also in other places, not just here. These glyphs are not just in one location on one beam, 100 meters above your head. Technology is everywhere throughout Egypt. Everywhere. And I've been all over Egypt. Okay. One last thing before we wrap up. I want to show you a correlation and a synchronization between Mars and Earth. <clears throat> right now, we're looking at a place on Mars called Cydonia. That's what the scientists and astrophysicists and the space agencies have named this region of Mars. If you take a really good look at it, you can see that it looks like kind of like a lion turning its head back like this. You can see that the face is up here in this area where you see the DNM pyramid. And then towards the back, it's like the hind of the actual lioness, right? Now, what's interesting about the name Cydonia, Cydonia is the ancient name for Cairo. <laughs> you don't think they knew that? <clears throat> Cydonia is the ancient name for Cairo. Pretty interesting. The other thing that's interesting is from this satellite image <clears throat> is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is that the Pleiadian star system can be shown here, okay, up here in this region um, above the head. And then also we see this DNM pyramid making this beeline towards the face of Mars, the, the world famous face of Mars that we all know about. And maybe some of you don't, but there was a face, a gigantic, huge face captured on Mars. It's a few miles across in diameter. And then up to this other artifact or or anomaly here uh right right where the pleiades uh starts right and then off to the right of that you have the orion star system here the orion's belt with these other pyramids you see that the one here to the far end is kind of worn down from weathering but these are three pyramids making up orion's belt just like the pyramids at giza align with orion's belt <clears throat> what's interesting here and why i bring this up is there's a correlation between cydonia in particular, this DNM pyramid, the face on Mars, and this other area perfectly match with a place on, on Earth. If you look at Avebury in the UK, in England, <clears throat> or the UK, right, and you download an ordnance map, the ordnance map is free. You can go to Google and type in Avebury UK ordnance map. That's how I got this. Okay, you can download it. <clears throat> now, what's interesting is this ordnance map. Uh, it has anomalies on it that are artificial. In other words, if you go to Avebury, UK, there's these gigantic mounds that were built uh, maybe hundreds, maybe even thousands of years ago, okay? These mounds were built at certain connection points that perfectly align with the anomalies on Mars. So if I take the, the Avebury, UK um, map, if I take the Avebury, UK map, and I overlay it over Cydonia, you almost see now an instantaneous match between these anomalies. They line up perfectly. In other words, Cydonia and Avebury UK are a mirror image. Somebody built Avebury to match that region of Mars. Who and why and how could that possibly be? Very interesting, guys. Another interesting anomaly here on Earth, you see Deir Allah in Jordan. If you look at Deir Allah from above, you can clearly see the face on Mars or something that looks very similar to the face on Mars. And on the right hand side, you see the actual face of Mars that was taken, you know, many, many years ago <clears throat> in Cydonia. And so, again, more circumstantial evidence showing that this was built uh 12th century bce about 800 years ago and this structure on mars was talked about being built in the sumerian tablets because this is actually this face is actually a gigantic temple <clears throat> built for uh, uh an anunnaki named alalu who was sentenced to die on mars according to the tablets pretty interesting stuff guys so i'm gonna stop sharing my screen now because we've went quite a bit of ways here and let me see if i can get back to this um 
stream yard. Here I go. I'm back. Okay. And um, somebody said they couldn't see. You couldn't see that information? Wow, we were on the screen share. I saw it on my phone. Um, they said, you just missed everything I showed. Wow, really? That's bizarre. I was, uh, everything was showing on my phone. Very clear as day. I was looking and, and seeing people chatting and commenting on what I, what I was showing. Maybe for some screens it wasn't, but uh, that's pretty interesting. So we couldn't see. Now we can see. Okay. Let me try something else one more time. Uh, yeah, I did share my screen. Let me share. Let me, let me go back because I was watching it on my phone at the same time. <clears throat> let me go back and just check something again. Is that my door? Okay. Okay, sharing the screen. That's bizarre. I wonder why it wasn't sharing. That's bizarre. I'm gonna go back again, guys, and re and revamp, re go over a couple of the last ones here. Uh, share my screen window. And let me look on my phone now just to make sure I check it here. <clears throat> That's pretty interesting. I wonder what caused that to disconnect like that. <clears throat> gonna go back to YouTube on my phone real quick to just see if it's sharing. Yeah, I can clearly see my screen on the phone. Okay, they so said they see it now. Okay. I don't know where it cut off or how how far back I lost you guys with the screen share. That's really strange. Uh, because I know that we saw those time temple together, but I'll go back here to the um I'm gonna go back here to Sidonia. Okay. So I can see it on my phone. Great. Now this is Sidonia. Let me just go over it one more time briefly. You can see this DNM pyramid beeline straight here to the face of Mars and then up to the base of the Pleiadian star system. And then down from the Pleiades, along the back line of this gigantic <clears throat> um, lioness, which is etched into the surface of Cydonia over the course of probably 400 miles is how big this, this, uh, this thing is. It's massive. You can see the Orion star system here along the back hind leg, the back hind of this actual lioness that's actually etched into, you know, this this planet. And this is crazy. First of all, the sheer scale of this uh, this anomaly, this whole region, the sheer scale of it is so massive. <clears throat> you'd have to be technologically advanced to build it because you need to be able to see it from space or from the sky to make sure that you're on target with what you're trying to design. Another thing that's interesting is how they have the star alignment with Orion, just like the Giza pyramids. And over here, you have the Pleiadian alignment here with the Pleiadian star system, which, by the way, the majority of my, my artifacts that I've been collecting artifacts for years have the Pleiadian star system on them. OK, they, they all showcase the Pleiades. And what do the Aboriginal people say? They say that we came from the Pleiades. That's what they say. And what's interesting is if you take this Avebury UK ordinance map and you take it and you overlay it <clears throat> over Cydonia, you get a perfect match. In other words, the anomalies here that you see perfectly match the mound and so forth that are on Cydonia, I mean, on Avebury. And when you merge Avebury UK and the, the Cydonia actual region, you get this perfect alignment of these anomalies right down to the meter. <clears throat> and what it tells us is that somebody copied on Earth a region of Mars named Cydonia, which means Cairo in ancient. And then when you come here to Deir Allah, <clears throat> you get to see this gigantic face, which is a mimic of the face on Mars, it's massive, as you can see here with the building structures next to it. It's massive. Built about 800 years ago. And the one on the right is Alalu, which is about two miles across. And it's on Mars in Cydonia. And uh, it's an actual temple. This, this actual face was a temple to, dedicated to Alalu, who was a, an Anunnaki that was sentenced to die on Mars. And the reason why he was sentenced to die is pretty gross. He challenged Anu to a battle, and he lost the battle. And when he lost the battle, these Anunnaki, when they would battle, they actually would battle naked. 
Okay, it was part of their warrior thing or whatever. And Anu had him down on his knees and had defeated him. <clears throat> the fight should have been over. It was not a battle to the death. But an Alalu jumped up with his mouth and bit off the private parts of Anu and swallowed it. And for that, he was sentenced to die on Mars. And this structure was built in his honor or maybe non-honor to make him infamous, I guess. But to show when you bite off the when you bite off a news thing, this is where you get sent. Crazy story in ancient tablets, guys. Crazy story. All right. And again, the Pleiades is so popular because everything is always centered around the Pleiades. It's always going back there. There was an ancient galactic war in the Pleiades. There was an ancient galactic war. And this war ravaged that region of space, ravaged that section of the Milky Way galaxy so badly that beings that had the capability to flee, they became space refugees, according to ancient texts, and they left that area and went to other star systems. There was a severe ancient war there, a galactic war, uh, that's talked about in a lot of ancient texts, okay? And so they spread out amongst the stars, Sirius, Orion, Aldebaran, Hades, you know, they spread out. The, some of these beings crash landed on a planet named Nibiru, much later in the tablets, renamed to Marduk, as he wanted to be named the planet that was the destroyer planet. And that planet, as you can see here in this image, was gravitationally captured by our solar system. And it orbits a brown dwarf star that orbits our star. So we live in a binary solar system. So I'm going to cover a lot of this going on into part two. OK, there'll be a whole nother part to this because we've gone far over an hour now and we're going to go into a whole nother section of this. But uh, the evidence is building and mounting or the evidence has been built and mounted. All the circumstantial evidence is here. Uh, we do live in a very incredible, incredible uh, uh, solar system in the Milky Way galaxy. And the evidence of these advanced beings, these Atlanteans. Uh, is all around us. We're standing on top of the evidence. Atlantis was not a ring city in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. That was just one capital. Atlantis was not just a global civilization on Earth. Okay, Atlantis, when you read, in, read into the text and you do the research, you discover that Atlantis was an interplanetary civilization that spanned across not only several planets, but even several star systems. They were interplanetary, okay? And so this information needs to get out. Everybody needs to know about this. And everything that I'm telling you can be researched, studied, all for yourself. It's not, uh, it's not hidden from you. It's just hiding in plain sight. Hiding in plain sight, okay? So, again, thank you for joining me tonight, guys. Uh, yes, there are shares of forbidden knowledge still available. And uh, a lot of people were asking... Uh, because the shares are almost completely gone. I'll drop the link in the live chat right now for you. I think there's only 20,000 shares left or something like that out of the 1 million. So <laughs> it really gone fast. Oh, I think there's only like 5,000 shares left. Hold on, guys. You guys got to hop on here quick. There's only a little bit left. You can see the number of shares right here. Okay, so I'm going to drop the shares. You can own shares of uh, Forbidden Knowledge. For one dollar per share. There you go. Boom. I just dropped the link there to you. You guys got to get on them quick because they're almost completely gone. All right. Um, and look forward to my new series, Ancient Connections, coming out starting next week. First episode next week on Forbidden Knowledge TV. Okay. A little bit, probably be a little bit more sensational uh, than, you know, with cutaways and infographics and things like that added to to bring more context and understanding to the show, all right? So I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, don't forget, we do have the Manifest Destiny Virtual Retreat 2022, and that is coming up very, very soon. That'll be January. If you're, trying, if, you, if you're a person that makes New Year's resolutions and you try to get fresh start to the new year, and you're trying to figure out how to become a great master at manifesting your reality, you're going to want to come to this 12-hour class. It's a 12-hour retreat that i'm doing virtually 12 hours guys six hours on saturday the eighth six hours on sunday the ninth okay and it's going to be amazing 
It's going to be absolutely amazing. And we're going to go over her learning, teaching her how to manifest from every different aspect of consciousness. And I have several teachers coming on with me. David Icke, Orisha Oshun, uh, Kenny Garcia, Dr. Julissa, uh, Maria Carson Redman, myself. Uh, it, it's going to be it's going to be a mind blowing event. You're not going to want to miss this. The amount of knowledge that's going to be taught is going to be incredible. And um, it's going to be a life changing situation. I've done these three years in a row and every single year I've got phenomenal, phenomenal uh, 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 testimonials. OK, and this one is going to be even better than the others because it's not just me speaking for six hours. This time it's 12 hours and it's multiple speakers, multiple gurus experts in their fields, bringing wisdom and knowledge on how to manifest from very different, all different aspects. And it's something that you can replay. You can replay it over and over again because it'll be on uh, an exclusive replay link that you can watch. You can have watch it on TV through the Forbidden Knowledge TV private access that you'll get. You can invite family members, friends over. You can share this knowledge with your kids and it's going to be phenomenal. So I just dropped the link in the chat for you to check that out as well. Okay. The minimum shares to buy is 250 shares at a dollar a share. And the reason why it has to be 250 minimum is because there's fees involved. So if somebody buys one share, it doesn't make it worthwhile. There's fees for the host. There's fees for the true crowd platform. There's fees for the escrow account and banking. There's fees for the attorney. And by the time you get it all done, you know, you're getting a fraction of, of money on each share for what the company does. So it has to be, you know, a minimum of 250 shares. Still a great, great ground floor opportunity. Remember when Microsoft was in the garage? Remember when Amazon was out of the garage? Remember when, when Elon Musk was sleeping in the warehouse at Tesla Motor Cars, sleeping in the actual warehouse where they make the cars every single night? Remember these now. Now look, don't forget, guys. Big things come in small packages. And right now, forbidden knowledge is here, and it's about to go there. Very, very rapidly, very quick. Forbidden Knowledge TV is here to stay. We passed our one-year anniversary. We flew right through. I think we're in 14 or 15 months now. 50,000 subscribers, a great network, 5,200 shows, and many more new shows coming in 2022. We've got some great new talent. We've actually signed people to TV deals and have their own TV shows in production. We're taking it all to a next level. The quality of production, the studio, and everything else is going to the next level. So we're looking forward to a beautiful and incredible 2022 where we can bring you to a higher level of consciousness on the Forbidden Knowledge TV platform. All right. Thank you, Wendy Love, says she loves the app. I appreciate you guys so much. Thank you for hanging out tonight. The link to everything I talked about as far as the shares and Forbidden TV and everything else is also going to be in the caption of this video. So once this video ends, it's already there. You can just go underneath this video and click the links right there for everything that I talked about tonight. All right. Hey, guys, I appreciate you guys. Peace. I love y'all, and I'll catch you on the backside.